And good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to North Sales, our Flying Scott uh, webinar number two. Uh, we appreciate you guys all joining us. We've had a tremendous amount of uh, response for these, and uh, I think uh, we're up over 300 people have registered to listen in. I'm not sure if you all will join us or not, but we're going to give a few more minutes to get folks out of that waiting room and into the webinar. So if you just bear with us just for a few minutes, we'll just have a little bit of a delay while we uh, get rolling here. And again, appreciate everybody who's uh, spending time on their holiday weekend. I know a lot of folks are celebrating a holiday this weekend, and we, we're hoping you guys all have a, a safe and, and healthy holiday in this peculiar times. So uh, bear with us just for a minute while we went, let a few more people in. Uh, just remember again, if you have uh, your video on, you want to make sure you turn your video off uh, as much as we'd love to see you. Um, the internet's forever, as I tell my kids. So uh, I'm just going to have uh, Greg and uh, Zeke here uh, join us in just a few minutes as we let a few more people into the waiting room. Again, appreciate you all being with us here. Uh, just a couple quick items before we start. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, the Fly Scott Sailing Association, if I can. That's your cue. There we go. Uh, we got Zeke running the slideshow, so that means I know at least he's online. So uh, a couple quick things. Uh, one, I had this huge speech made about buying raffle tickets for the boat raffle. I was all queued up. I got a full page about uh, promoting it. And about two days ago, Diane said, don't do that. We sold all the tickets. So uh, congratulations to the, everybody in the class for, for stepping up and uh, buying the raffle tickets for, for, the, uh, for a great cause for the class. And uh, hopefully I'm going to buy, uh, I, hopefully I bought one of the winning tickets. That's what I'm hoping for. Uh, my kid wants a boat. So um, in any case, uh, be that as it may, uh, the Fly Scott Sailing Association is still eager to have your membership. Uh, if you haven't renewed, if you do uh, all of us putting these things together a favor and uh, renew your membership right after this webinar this afternoon. Um, if you've never been a member of the association, it's a great time to join. Uh, the Fly Scott uh, class has a lot of things that they work on, including the Fly Scott Sailing Association Foundation, uh, the Scots and Water, which is one of the better publication that any one design class puts out with great articles and information. Uh, that's all part of membership. Um, not, not only that, but the efforts they put into promotion and education. And the last thing, which I find probably most important as a boat owner, is um, a good, strong class association helps retain the value of your boat. And so uh, that, that one year membership uh, does a lot to support the class and put a whole bunch of this stuff together. Uh, I just actually, this past week, um, Jim Leggett put together a, a little bit of a, of a uh, call talking about class membership. Uh, Nancy Claypool, Bill Dunham was on there. I know Eric Bustle was on the call, Bruce Kitchen, Diane Camp, all these people working really hard on ideas to make sure the class uh, stays strong. So uh, if, again, if you've never been a member, uh, join up. I know that, like I said, there's several hundred people who are gonna be uh, listening to this webinar. And uh, if you haven't renewed your membership, now's the time. So I think we got a lot of the people from the waiting room in. And uh, first first thing I want to do is, is introduce kind of our, our speakers here. And uh, you guys, anybody who listened to our last webinar will remember Zeke Horowitz. Zeke is our three-time North American champion, uh, four-time midwinter champion, sailing with his dad, Jay. And Zeke, I think you're there because the slides are moving. So you with me? I'm here. Yeah, sorry about the delay on that first one. I was, I was drowning off. But yeah, I'm around. I'm here. Great to be with you, Brian. I'm super excited to have everybody that's joining us here. It's cool to see this level of participation. And I know last time we, uh, we volunteered Greg to join us in here. And thank goodness he decided to come. So it looks like you guys are all excited to, to have Greg join us here. So Greg, Greg, are you on the line with us? I am. Zeke, that's thanks great. a lot for having me, Brian. And you guys, I'm I'm honored to be a part of this, and it's great to be back with the Flank Scott class. I sure. Yeah, well, we're day. we're unbelievably grateful to have you with us, Greg. I mean, you can see your your accolades on here. You're definitely one of the winningest uh, people to ever race in the class. We're all trying to chase you down and attempt to get our name on these trophies, maybe half as much as you have. So we're really glad to uh, to have you with us. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, as for those of you folks who don't know, Greg is, uh, I don't want to say a mentor to me because he's only a little bit older than I am, mean, a bit, but, you know, Greg and, uh, has really worked hard with Zeke and I, both of us over the years, and 
um, you know, just, just a tremendous positive influence. Uh, anything that I've done well has come from kind of Greg's direction. And I know anything uh, Zeke's done well has come from Jay's direction with a little bit of influence from, from, from Greg. But Greg, real quick, before we step into all this stuff, I, I did want to mention something and ask you a little bit about, we saw on the, uh, the Fly Scout web, um, Facebook page about your new website. And I wonder if you'd just take a minute or two and kind of bring everybody up to date with what you're up to now and uh, maybe talk a little bit about your website real quick. Well, sure. Thanks, Brian. Well, first, I just want to say I've been really lucky to have both these guys, both Brian and Zeke, um, sailing with me, and we've had a great time. Um, I'm not sure they'd look at it the same way, but we did do a lot of sailing together. Which <laughs> but, but thanks. Yeah, I, you know, in my career, the part I've always enjoyed the most is, is coaching and help people go faster and enjoy the sport. So now that that's what I'm doing 99% of the time, I've kind of rebuilt my old website, Greg Fisher Sailing, and I'm putting some of my old articles, some of the new articles and videos that I've taken and I will take on there to, you know, so people can look at them and hopefully learn a little bit from them and maybe incite some questions. So it's there for anybody to look at that they'd like. And, um, but thanks for pointing it out, Brian. I appreciate it. Oh, no worries. You know, your treasure trove of, of information. We've learned, both learned a ton from you over the years. And uh, obviously putting all that stuff and resource into the Greg Fisher Sailing website is just gonna be a, a huge help to a lot of folks. So um, Zika, maybe you can just kind of turn it over to you. I know you're driving the bus insofar as the slide presentation. So maybe you can kind of maybe a little bit explain what, uh, what the format is here today and uh, get us going here. Yeah, Brian keeps pointing out that I'm driving the slideshow. So when it gets messed up, you all know it was me that messed it up. Um, so we can definitely do that. We wanted to set this one up as sort of a, a bit of a QA and a uh, with Greg and, and, and obviously Brian and me kind of answering some questions and we were, we're grateful that y'all submitted some really good stuff to us. So we're going to sort of just go through a couple of the questions that you guys submitted to us and we'll kind of answer those questions a little uh, back and forth with the three of us kind of sharing our opinions on some of those questions and then we'll dive in to some videos like we had last time. Uh, kind of wrap up at the end with some spinnaker trim stuff. So we'll kind of jump right in. The first question that we got was about the jibs. And we actually, we get this question quite often, um, you know, from folks who are trying to figure out what jib maybe they have. If it's an older jib, they want to kind of figure out what it is. But um, what's the difference between the loose, snug, and tight rig jibs and, and how to tell what I have? So when I got into the class, it was just snug. I've only ever used a snug rig jib. Um, but and they had the nice little label there at the bottom, so it was always easy for me to tell. But I thought you guys, you know, you were around for the development of, you know, all three of those jibs in the design process. So I thought the two of you could kind of share some light on uh, how that all went down when it did. Yeah, well, that uh, yeah, real quick, Zeke. I, you know, in, in our, um, I think it's a great question, and one of the reasons we're having Greg on. It's like you said, Greg was uh, a big big part of influencing, you know, some of the sale development we have with the gym. And, and Greg, maybe you can go through the details about, you know, like, like Zeke said, he came in with the snug rig. I came in, you know, in the early 90s, late 80s, and it was all loose rig. There was no such thing as a, a tighter snug rig. And maybe you can talk, talk us through a little bit about, you know, how we got to where we're at now and some of the thought process. Sure. Well, right, Brian, back when uh, we were, you know, initially flint sailing the Scott and the way so many people sailed the Scott in the past, the rigs were loose. And there's roughly three to four inches of slop in the rig. And, um, and it was a very successful way to sail the boat. A lot of people did it and a lot of people were very fast. Um, but a lot of us remember Graham Hall and what a great guy he was and what he did for the class too. And, and frankly, this was one of his ideas, and he pushed us to try a tight rig jib. His thought was with the loose rig jib, making sure the boat was set up properly really depended on having perfect main sheet trim. If the main sheet was too loose, the rig would rock forward, the jib would get really full because of luff sag. If you over trim the main, not only was the main over trim, the jib became too flat. So his idea was, Let's do what a number of other classes have done and make the rig really, really tight, recut the jib to match that tight rig, and, um, and then we'll have a much simpler boat to sail. So we did that, and it worked great. We went to a super tight rig where I think roughly the forestay had over 300 pounds on it, 
and um, and it worked well. We broke a lot of stuff getting it there. <laughs> uh, the Howyer, the Forestay, and um, and we also found that on some mass where it didn't sit perfectly flat on the step, it would rock back and forth, and it was maybe a little bit too tight. Thus entered the snug rig jib where um, the rig was a little bit looser, and and you guys will talk about the tuning here in a little bit, but the pounds were, you know roughly 80 to 100 pounds versus 300 pounds. And it was in between the loose and the tight rig, but it was much simpler to sail. And it made the boat much more, in our mind at that time, and in Graham's mind, much more one design and, um, and still um, a very fast setup and tuning program. Yeah, yeah it, it, it was interesting during that time, Greg, and like you mentioned about how much rig tension we were carrying back then and how come, you know, it got a little little scary on, on occasion, you know, where the masks maybe didn't entirely behave the way we were hoping they would. And, you know, the idea, the other thing I think that, you know, maybe you can agree with me or not is that, you know, when it got really windy, carrying that much love curve and that much depth in the, in the jib got a little bit dicey to sail the boat really well when it got breezy. Yeah. So, yeah. It, it created its own problems. And certainly now the snug rig is a great compromise that really makes the boat a lot easier to sail. So what, what is the difference? What did you guys do uh, along that path to get there? What is the actual difference on the sales? Well, uh, so Zeke, what, um, basically, what, you know, when, when Greg and, and Graham were kind of going through this, we basically decided just to take the standard loose rig jib that we're using back then and just add love curve to it and just basically added, um, you know, more salary in the front, which allowed for the head stayed to be really tight and didn't really accommodate any or hardly any sag in the sail. So basically the sail was always going to be the same shape. With a loose rig, as Greg mentioned, the, the amount of head stay sag was really dependent on how much vang and or main sheet tension we were using. And so if you pulled the main sheet really hard with the loose rig, the head stay would go straight and the jib would flatten out. So, you know, we went from very loose rig to a very tight rig and we went, you know, very extreme, kind of the Chet Proctor thinking, if you're going to make a change, make a big change. And so that's uh, what ended up happening. We ended up bumping it. Greg, I'm not sure if I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but I want to say it was, uh, I can't remember how many centimeters uh, that we bumped. Yeah, I mean, it was a good solid inch and a half from the loose rig to the tight rig that we changed, you call it the luff curve in the front to match that change in the shape. And, right. and just to give perspective, if you're talking about an inch and a half of love curve on like a TP-52, everybody goes, wow, that's tremendous. You know, so it, you're talking about a, a big, big change. And so, um, and you can see Zeke has drawn that line and that's basically, you know, this is a 2D shape of, a, of our actual current uh, jib. And that's the amount of, of when laid out a 2D position, uh, you know, how much love curve or positive it has. Uh, when you're talking about the tight rig, it would have been bumped out from the snug another, I want to say another uh, two and a half centimeters up at, up in panel four. And the the loose rig would even be less than that. So, uh, so again, that's the difference between the sales. That's kind of how we got where we're at. Uh, and then the other part of the question real quick is that how do I tell whether I have a, um, a tight rig or a loose rig or a snug rig? And this comes kind of comes back that when the, the tight rig came out, um, the girths on the on the the current at the rules back then didn't quite manage this particularly well. So the class did a really good job of saying, let's let's get a rule in here that kind of limits what we can go do with that. So there is a measurement from the top batten to the luff of the sail. And if you don't have in our particular model of sail, we have a little sticker in the past four or five years, it says snug rig down the bottom. So uh, if it's a snug rig down the bottom, you have a snug rig jib. That's pretty easy. Um, but if you have an older sail and you're not quite sure, you can measure across from that top batten as Zeke's drawn to the closest point on the luff there. And if you, you connect with your sail maker, they're going to be able to tell you basically, if you say, yeah, I, I have this, this is my measurement, uh, I, they're going to be able to tell you which would say you have. There's a little couple millimeters of difference between each sail. It's not a perfect science, but we're really, really close. Um, so. Uh, that's one way to do it. If you're not sure with other sailmakers, I mean, I'm not sure what everybody has insofar as what their, what their snug rig measurement is there, but um, that's, that's the, the quickest way. If you're not sure, measure across there and reach out to Zeke or myself if you have a north, and we'd be happy to, to answer that question. So, 
That makes sense to you all? Makes sense to anybody? Yeah, I, was, I appreciated the history lesson. So we'll move, we'll move on to this, uh, this next question that was submitted. You know, it's kind of a sale maintenance question. Is it okay to apply a lubricant like Teflon dry lube to the metal snap buttons that connect the jib to the four stay? So talking about the little snaps you actually hank around uh, around the four stay um, to go sailing. So what do you guys think about this one? I'm going to step in real quick, Zeke, because I'm going to throw this right back at you and Greg. Maybe you can switch the slide here real quick. But um, I, I think that that's probably the the one thing on sales that really require some level of, of maintenance all the time. And you uh, you look at it one way insofar as how you guys both like to do it, and then I'll maybe kind of touch base a little bit about what I'm looking at. So, um, so Zeke, you, you were mentioning what you think the, the most critical yeah. thing to make sure these are going to work out well. It's a, it's a preventative maintenance thing to me, which is just rinsing it out with fresh water. I know I, we do a lot of sailing down in like the Sarasota Bay area or Florida where there's a lot of, uh, lot of salt in the water, a lot of salt in the air, and the salt is really what kind of can bind these things up. So, you know, after a, a nice windy day on Sarasota Bay, we take some time and just kind of squirt the hose right into these snaps, both the one on the sail and the one on the webbing here and just get all that salt water out of there. So that's, that's the biggest thing to me is a nice fresh water rinse. You can um, let it dry off a little bit before you put it in the bag for a long period of time. Uh, that's really good, but a little bit of fresh water goes a really long way. But that said, I, I mean, I got no problem using um, McLube or, or a product like that to kind of help um, loosen it up a little bit and get make it a little bit easier to do. Um, I got no problem kind of doing that. I've even seen uh, in, a, in a pinch when you're trying to leave the dock and snap it on or something, I see some people spray some some of that sunscreen in there if it's in the spray can and even that that can help so for sure so Greg, well, how about how about for sure yeah. yeah well i i agree um and i learned a lot here to be honest with you. I, like zeke i think it's really important to continually make sure your sails are clean and salt as best you can and i used to use some wd-40 every once in a while on the snaps but invariably it would leave a nasty stain and um it wasn't worth it but this stuff, the dry lubricant, especially this McLube, is a great product, and um, um, it's cool to see what it'll do. This is yeah, a, and Zeke, if you could just kind of point out a little bit, just for people who aren't quite sure how this whole system works, I'm sure everybody understands how a button snap works, but this is a picture of a button snap here. If you look in the left-hand side over by my thumb, you'll see it's basically just a spring inside a circle. And as Zeke mentioned, salt is a big, 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 killer with any metals and stuff. So anybody who lives anything, anything north of Florida dealing with salt on the roads, no metal and salt don't get along. And that's usually 90% of the problem. But even just putting things away wet can start to have, have that little inexpensive, crummy little spring start to seize up and rust up. So fresh water and drying them off. And if you really get into a pinch, uh, I have no problem with McLube. I always have McLube in my toolbox. Uh, I use it for the snaps. Uh, I'm not, the McLube won't damage the sails. Matter of fact, sails get dipped in McLube uh, sail coat. So it's it's not a problem insofar as like Greg was mentioned, staining stuff. Um, the other thing that uh, I personally use McLube for, and we can talk about it a little later, maybe is uh, if, if the telltales get stuck, you can always spray some McLube around where the telltales are that you're steering with, with the jib. And some of those yarn ones will get, uh, maybe get stuck in a seam or get a little bit of um, uh, static charge to them and get stuck to free a little bit. And I well, sometimes will spray that area around where the, uh, where the, where the telltoes are. But in any case, that, to, to the answer to the, the real question, which was about the button snaps, you know, they're really not designed to, to last five, six, seven, eight years. And sometimes they do. And if they do that, they're really because someone's maintaining them well. And so rinse them out, hose them down uh, and, Worst case scenario, McLubin. And real quick, Zeke, and I don't want to stay too long on this, but you mentioned something uh, in our, our kind of practice session talking about these. If when you get one stuck, what how do you how do you unstick it? And you know, none of us are a big fan of grabbing pliers and pulling it. So what what, what were you? Yeah, I see I see that a, a lot actually. Uh, you know, it's kind of the last resort, especially after you know a long day on the water and you're, you're in and you just want to get the snap off. You see people grab the tab right where you see Brian's thumb in this picture with some pliers and just start ripping it off. And that uh, frequently leads to these buttons kind of ripping off. So if you just kind of, if you can get both your thumbs like kind of underneath the lip of the snap and press up with both thumbs kind of equally on either side, you might have a little bit more success. It might hurt your thumbs a little bit if it's really jammed in there, but that 
it's a it's a better way to get it off. So you might try that before you go to the pliers and start ripping that off. That's my only tip. Okay. I got a little quick message here before we move on from Larry Anderson saying a uh, little beeswax is a environmentally friendly solution to that. So I've never used beeswax, but uh, I'm going to make a note of it. Thank you very much, Larry. That's a that's a great little tip, and if it works, it's a great tip. So thanks thanks for sending that in. Yeah, that's awesome. And before maybe we jump, we'll jump into this next question. But before we do, we there is the chat feature in this um, in this meeting here at the bottom of your screen. You'll find a little chat box, and we'll be opening that here fairly soon. And you'll be able to type in some questions, and we'll do our best to answer those live uh, if we have the time. But for now, we'll move on here. So the question's about rig tuning. Um, we got a question that said, I've never done anything to tune my rig. How does it matter? And how do I do it? And Brian, you were very nice and went out into your backyard where you just happened to have a Flying Scott rigged up and you took some really, uh, some good pictures for us. But before we got there, you want to just talk about the first place to start. Yeah, I, yeah this, uh, this uh, downtime has enabled me to set up all my boats. I've got a backyard full of, full of boats, good, bad, or indifferent. So, and uh, anyway, um, yeah, the first place to start obviously is with your Sailmakers tuning guide. And I know for us, we have ours online. Um, this is just the first couple pages of a PDF of our tuning guide. And, you know, Zeke and I, when we're setting this, uh, this webinar up, got talking a little bit about this and we made it very clear we need to update our tuning guide. And we were kind of laughing because uh, if you look at the picture there with the orange handle with the ratchet, uh, give you an idea of how much we need to update the tuning guide, that, that's Greg's hand. So that's Greg's uh, picture of his hand back when he was kind of doing this. So anyway, long story short, um, there's going to be an update that the downside that we're kind of experiencing is going to give us a window of opportunity to introduce some more uh, tuning features. And there, there's a, a couple of new ones that we, uh, we've we been working on. And mostly the guys in Florida, right? You and Jeff Zeke and, and a couple other folks down there came up with a little bit more of a, maybe a cleaner solution to kind of the initial setups. And maybe we can go through the, that a little bit and kind of touch base. But again, reach out to your sale maker. Uh, the Flying Scott, North Sales Flying Scott Tuning uh, Guide is online, and um, if anybody has any questions about that or something doesn't make sense, um, call Zeke. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please do. Happy to help. Um, yes, basically, Brian was just mentioning, just we, we didn't change the tuning necessarily from what's in the tuning guide. It's all kind of hitting the same numbers, but just a bit of an easier way to check it. And what we're going to go go through here real quick is just getting your your mast rake in the right spot and kind of the the old school way to do it was to hoist the tape measure up to the top of your mast and measure back to the spot on your transom and get that kind of 28 5 28 5 and a half number uh, to set your rake but we've probably all experienced trying that out when it's blowing more than four and a half knots in the parking lot and the tape measure is blowing all over the place and um, that the main halyard shackle might capsize a little bit at the top you might have a different size jackal there's just a couple too many variables there so some of the the guys down in florida started just measuring it a bit of a different way which we use in, in other classes as well um, but the idea here what you see in the picture that's the jib halyard um, so the mast is up the forest stays connected everything is connected like you're about to go racing and all you do is you just bring the shackle of the jib halyard down right in front of the mast so up against the front of the mast as you see in the picture down to the deck and you lock in your halyard just at that spot where it's maybe hanging, you know, a couple millimeters above the deck and you can just pull a tiny bit of tension down and kiss the deck with, uh, with the bottom of your jib halyard shackle. So that's what you see there in that left photo. And then all you do from there, you leave it locked in on your, on your halyard and you swing it forward to the head stay. And right where the bottom of the shackle meets the head stay, like you see in that picture all the way on the right, you just put a mark on the head stay in that position. Um, we've got it at the top of that tape just to kind of make it easy to see here. We, we use a Sharpie on our boat or um, some black nail polish will kind of actually last a little bit longer, but you just put a mark there um, and then you're just measuring up from the deck right where your head stay goes in, uh, right in through the plate there. You can see in that picture on the right, you measure up to that mark that you just made on your head stay and it should be about 16 inches. So 16 inches there is uh, that correlates to that 28.5 measurement that we're all pretty pretty comfortable with. And um, you know, that's it's a really good starting place. This is a great, great um, way to get you in the ballpark on your, um, 
on your mass rake. If you're within, you know, plenty of the fastest boats out there are within kind of a quarter inch of that. So 15 and, and uh, you know, three quarters or 16 and a quarter, that's all fine to get you in the ballpark. But I thought, um, I thought, Greg, maybe you could jump in and just sort of, you were the one who kind of came up with that initial uh, mass rake that's still working all these years later. I don't know, 50 or 60 years since you've been sailing the Flying Scott, I think, but it's still working really good. Now. So we thought yeah. if you could <laughs> just, just run us through how you got there and how that kind of impacts the balance of the boat. Well, frankly, Zeke, that the class had been, you know, setting it up that way for years. And I think the reason that that was sort of important is because when you had the loose rig and the slop, it was easy to measure when the mast was leaning back at the transom and when the mast was pulled forward at the transom. And that's how you'd get the change. But I think this is brilliant. I think this makes it much simpler. You don't have to have the big, long, honking uh, tape measure. And like you say, when it's windy or the boat's balanced on the parking lot, it, it's a really neat way to do it. And I, I think this is really cool. Well, Zeke, a couple of quick things that to, to just kind of go over with this. And obviously, what we're really trying to do with this is make it so that we get a consistent break from all the boats, right? So that the, the mast and your, your you know, center of effort is in the right place. So we're trying to, you know, talk about balance the boat. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the video. But there's a couple of quick questions. And one is, um, comes from Neil, and he's talking about the actual tension we're trying to achieve. And, and before I dive into that, I just want to uh, tell everybody that we're all sailing with eighth inch four stays now. And I, I'm pretty sure that the, uh, the factory is pretty much all at eighth inch four stays and they certainly make them if you don't have an eighth inch four stay. Uh, now, you know, when we were sailing with loose rigs, uh, the, the thinner three, three seconds four stay was fine. Uh, but I think now that we started putting tension on the head stays, uh, we've gone to eighth inch on the heads on the four stay. So I think that that's pretty important. Um, I, it, it stretches just a little bit less and just a little bit easier to get a consistent number. Certainly, if it's not the most expensive upgrade you'd ever make on your boat. So if you're, if you're not sure if you have an eighth inch four stay, uh, it's certainly something to, to look into before you put your boat together this spring. But there was, somebody's asking about the actual tension and what we're targeting insofar as tension. And there is, there is a, a pretty reasonably wide window, right, insofar as tension. And maybe you can kind of touch on what you're sailing at for tension wise and, and how you kind of got there. Yeah, um, well, I took advice from from Jeff and Amy Linton when I first got in the class on how to set set the boat up, and you know, if it was good enough for them, it was certainly good enough for me. And I, so I I went with that. And when I get to those, I've had a couple new boats since then. It you know it takes a little while for the wires to stretch in and, and get to the tension that's right. But once it's there, I never I I don't adjust my rig ever. Um, I never change the tension once it's there. And for me, I, I use that PT one loose gauge, uh, and so on the head stay, I read about. 10, 11 ish on the, on the head stay. And it tends to wander a little bit. And you might even notice it definitely changes what, if the boat's sitting on the trailer or if it's floating in the water. Uh, but on the trailer, we try to read about 10 or 11 on the head stay it seems to be about the right kind of all purpose ballpark. And I, I learned the hard way one time how important that is. And you know, it's, you're kind of chasing your tail a little bit. There's only so much you can do with your side shroud adjustments. Um, if you want to stay at this this rake measurement, and I had a new boat, and I was just it was settling in. I was having a hard time getting there, and I really wanted to have the rake right on 16, um, but I was a little bit too tight on the shrouds. And I was like, ah, oh, it's you know, it's a new boat; it'll stretch a little bit. And I went sailing at the midwinters uh, last year on the first day, and I was just a little bit too tight. I was reading more like 14 or 15 on the head stay, but the 16 was re was really quite perfect. And I, I tell you what, it was the slowest I've ever been and a lighter day on a flying Scott. And it was, um, so I, I learned the lesson really, really the hard way that I think, you know, from now on I go with the, uh, the tension being correct at that 10 or 11 where the head stays able to sag and the jib can kind of get the right shape. Is that kind of what you guys are always going for too, Greg? I know this rake measurement is really important, but um, how do, you know, if you had to choose one tension or rake, what do you do? Oh, without question. Just like you said, Zeke, the rig tension is everything. And, you know, there's so many variables that, that take care of the balance. And, you know, obviously if the rake is set to a certain spot, that will affect how the, bow, the boat feels when it's going upwind and what the helm will feel like. But just a little bit of heel one way or the other, or just a little bit of trim on the main will affect that balance as well. So going with like what you're saying and your experience tells you the rig tension is really, really critical. 
So uh, real quick, and somebody mentioned, and I think, uh, actually Roy uh, has put a little question in the chat room and says it's a silly question, but it's absolutely not a silly question. It's, is all the, um, are the side st uh, stays and the three holes all standard on all the Flying Scots? And you know, we, we have been talking a little bit about getting the, the shrouds to match up so that the tensions are right and the four stay length is, is in that 16 range. You kind of were mentioned a couple of things about different options you can do with those side shrouds, right? Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of, for sure. There's a lot of like guess and check kind of involved when you're tuning the rig. Um, and the, the chain plates on the side are, are fairly limited. And like, if you make a half hole change on the side, it's a really, really big change in the tension. So while you're doing that, I know on the newer boats, I think after maybe 5,500 or so, don't forget that there's also uh, two holes up at the top where the shrouds attach at the top to the mast. Um, and those are, that's actually, I, I didn't realize that, but I think Tyler pointed that out to me when he was helping me tune the boat. And uh, that was the difference for getting our boat tuned up was moving up to the top hole, I believe. And that kind of got the range a little bit better for us. So don't forget about that. But you also, you know, you see some people will change out the chain plates to get a little bit more, a little bit more range on. Some people have to add toggles in the head stay, depending on the age of the boat. Uh, but I think it's really, really important. I think Greg nailed it. I'd much rather be off by, you know, even up to a quarter inch on this head stay than, than be too tight or, or way too loose on the, on the tension. It's really important. And I think to, to Roy's point about it is that, you know, these boats, uh, you know, Flying Scott's been around for a bunch of decades. And, you know, one of the great things about it is there's, you know, single digit, double digit boats still sailing around, you know, competitively. And they, they're nothing is exactly the same as it was, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago. So the fact that, you know, we have boats that, um, you know, are competitive and still fast and still usable and still, you know, do really well uh, and still, you know, that goes back to retain the value. But the fact that, you know, a brand new boat out of the factory is probably going to be a little bit different than a boat that was built 25, 30 years ago, even though, you know, the factory's, you know, very tight as far as they do it, but some things have changed. And like Zeke said, they, that second hole added at the top since we started tension the rigs you know, 15, 18 years ago, I think has made, uh, you know, that's one, one thing. So if you're sailing around with an original mast, a 2000 series boat, it's possible you don't have that second hole drilled up in that, in that uh, chain plate up at the top. So um, anyway, it wasn't, it wasn't a silly question at all. It's a really, really good question to ask. It's the kind of stuff that's really going to help us uh, answer the question. The other thing that just came through a chat box. Um, do you have any idea what, what, what pound tension uh, you have, Zeke? And I, I know you're going to say you don't know the, any idea if you could go uh, by the PT loose gauge. Um, but I, I, I think I'll tell people that I, I basically the, the target's anywhere from zero or from 70 to 120. And I've seen lighter, much lighter teams and heavier be a little bit heavier, uh, a little tighter. But I think if I was going to guess, and I, again, I don't know those numbers off top of my head either, but I'd guess that Zeke's under 110 pounds of, of tension uh, in his four stay. It might be, a, might be closer to 100, so. Yeah, Brian, that's, I was going to kind of correct myself. I said the rig tension is critical, you know, and I think while you want to be in the ballpark, the ballpark, like you point out, is 70 to 100-ish, so you do have a little bit of range, and um, and then you can use that range for different weights, right? And that's what you're, what you just said, which is, I think, valuable to remember. Yeah. And real quick, another question, and uh, this is uh, for Gary, uh, is that the, the, the gauge we, we use, Zeke, is the PT? PT1 PT loose PT, gauge. Yeah. So lose, L-O-O-S, lose gauge, uh, available West Marine, available online. Um, it's a black spring type scale. Uh, that you know, you, you hook on the, the four stay and you can leave it and make adjustments to it. Very common in every class. Uh, if you have a fleet, uh, I think what a lot of fleets have done, I don't know how much the, the actual tool costs themselves, maybe 140 bucks, 150 bucks, I'm guessing. Uh, but what a lot of fleets will do is buy one as a group. It's, it's not necessary if you're sailing against your own group of people in a fleet, you could kind of share a lose gauge if you don't want to invest 150 bucks in one. You can split it between a few people. So that's, but it is important if you're all trying to get competitive and stay the same. I don't think, I don't think we go to a regatta without making sure that our attention's right. I'm pretty sure that, you know, before I pushed off for, for an axe or a midwinters, I'd, I'd want to make sure that that's in the ballpark, so. 
Um, and real quick, Zeke, before we step off of this, and, and I, I was, a, you know, for everybody, Greg and, and Zeke and I spent a lot of time kind of doing dry runs and, and trying to get through this without laughing at each other during our practice sessions. But, um, you know, one of the things that Zeke had mentioned was side shroud tension. Someone did ask about that, and we were trying to, you know, maybe there was a, a quick way you can kind of say what you target your side shrouds at, Zeke. I don't know if you have that number off the top of your head, but somebody was asking about it. Yeah, the side shrouds are going to read kind of in a range between about 19 and 22 when you're in this sort of nine and a half to 10 or 11 on your head stay. The side shrouds are going to read kind of in that 20 range. So that's where that's where we and that's been every boat that I've sailed. We get the we set the rake right, get that check the head stay, and then that's what the side shrouds are reading. So we do check that just to kind of make sure, but. I've never had an issue trying to chase my tail in there, trying to get it, uh, yeah. trying to chase it out. Excellent. So anyway, that's uh, that kind of touches a little bit on what we target for for tuning. I don't want to say that we want to try to, uh, you know, it's too simple. And obviously, there's a little bit of of uh, trial and error in getting the numbers you really want to to make sure you're you're in the ballpark. But these are basically the steps we go through just to get the rake right, uh, get the head stay tension right. And then honestly push off the dock and go sailing and see how the boat feels. I know, you know, I remember Mark Egan talking about, you know, loosening his head stay two turns because he could feel the difference. And I've never been able to, to get that good at it to feel the difference. I think if I can get it to the point where I'm close to what Zeke or Jeff is doing, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy. So those are the targets we're kind of going through. And if anybody has questions specifically or any of it's confusing, please reach out to Zeke or myself. We'd be happy to, to walk you through it and try to try to help you understand so right on well let's move on to the next question we've got some videos to kind of support this one so we got a question about roll tacking what is the best way to roll tack a scott in various conditions so again we wanted to say a, a really big thank you to our friend eric bussell who made these videos uh, a while back and has made them all available to us uh, they're, they're really coming in handy for us so thank you eric it's um really great to have them. Uh, so the question was about roll tacking and we're kind of looking at a video where we may or may not really be roll tacking because it's a little bit too much wind but I know this isn't like you're out there you know the, the idea of roll tacking is not like you're out there in an Olympic laser or a college dinghy like an FJ where you're gonna you know really throw the boat over on yourself and do a big squish and flatten and, and come out a little bit faster but in the flying sky roll tacking is really more about um, just helping the boat not really decelerate. And so if it's, if it's light air enough that your, your crew is for sure sitting inside the boat, uh, maybe even to lure it, once you do the tack, they're just going to be able to come up to what was just the weather rail, now becoming the lured rail, and just kind of sit there and let the sails kind of flop over on top of them. And as the sails power up with your body weight on that side, the boat's just going to heel over a little bit. And then you can, depending on how much wind there is, maybe just the skipper goes up and flattens, maybe the crew flattens halfway, but you just kind of then go over and squish the boat flat and it just helps the boat um, stay up to speed a little bit more. Um, but we thought we could just kind of run through and play some of this video here. And uh, there are some tacks that we'll do. Uh, we can do some slow motion. And Greg, I know you had some thoughts on, on this stuff. Yeah, well, I, I just think right here, um, Zeke, if you could just hesitate for a sec. Um, do you mind? Yeah, right there. Can you stop? Just watch you guys how little Zeke is moving the tiller. You know, we've, you've always heard and, and these guys have talked about a balanced helm, you know, and it's blowing enough here that they're hiking a bit and there's a little bit of heel, but Zeke still has a helm right down the center. And can I just add one other thing about tacking that I think is important and just adding to what you're saying about the roll tack or maybe not exactly a roll tack in the Scott is the value of getting around in such a way that the sails don't luff much in the middle of the tack because the more the sails luff the more drag you'll have and the slower the boat will go through the middle of the tack so when you watch Zeke and Jay go through these tacks you'll see the sails really don't luff much they go right from starboard to port and fill pretty quickly. And you notice there, Zeke has trimmed the main end tighter and there he's starting to ease it out. So the sail really didn't luff, but a couple seconds, if that.
Yeah, and I think sometimes we, we bring up the question of if there's going to be any backwind in the jib. And we don't we try not to backwind it too terribly much, but just kind of let the jib fill uh, just for a second and then kind of snap through. But there's not a whole lot of backwinding going on. I don't see, think. And see, do you think that that depends a little bit on the condition? I mean, if it's really light and you're having trouble getting the bow around, I mean, do you, do you tend to backwind it a little bit more? This is a condition is obviously enough pressure that you and Jay are up on the rail. And Jay even backwinds it right there just a fraction. And like you, I think that's kind of a little bit what you're talking about, just so the clue gives a little bit of load, helps push the bow across. But I'm wondering if it's lighter air, if that might hang in there just a fraction longer. Yeah, maybe just a fraction longer. Uh, certainly, if it was real windy, you wouldn't be looking to backwind it very much. You want to make sure it's out of the cleat so you don't even tip over if it stays in the cleat. But in the lighter, you might backwind it a little bit longer just because as it fills, it's going to help finish the turn uh, and get the bow out of the wind. But it's, I just don't like doing it for too long. Uh, I don't know, Greg, what did you think about that? Yeah, no, I completely agree. I, I, a guide we tried to use is that the jib would back until the main gets across and just starts to fill on the new tack. Not, not completely filled, but just starts to fill. So then you have something that the crew can glance up, up, up at the main, see that it's just starting to get onto the new tack and then they know it's time to blow the weather sheet and get it around to lured. See, can, can I ask you to just touch on a couple things here that I think is real, like right there, you're holding the hiking stick, that, that's perfect. And you're holding, I don't know if that's the vang or the main sheet there, but you've got them both in your hand so you can adjust the vang or you can reach down if you're going downwind to do the board, maybe touch on that. And then maybe as you're going through the tack, touch on what you're doing with your hands and how you switch and the, the gymnastics to getting across and, and, and just where you put your hands in. And, and before you do, if, before you do that, Zeke, and, and all part of it, if you could just go back a second or two, I just want to, to also have this it helps people that are listening in. Watch what you do with with that Vang line that's gonna that you're gonna need on the other tack, which is like something that's so cool that you know I wouldn't even think to do this because I'm not that. But that little toss right there, you know, you're gonna tack and the Vang's gonna be over there and you you're gonna need it and. I mean, I can't tell you about times that I tack and then I've got to put, you know, my whole big body into the middle of the boat to go get the vang again. But just those little tricks right there, that's, that's really cool. So, you know, to Greg's point, maybe you can go through the choreography, including all that kind of little stuff. So. Yeah, I, I definitely, as we kind of talked about in that last video, I'm a, I have to have the vang either. If it's not in my hand, it's on my lap or right next to me. So I definitely have to get the vang on that other side of the boat so I'm ready to make adjustments coming out of the tack. But to your point, Greg, I, you know, I've, I've got a dinghy sailing background. So from sailing opties, when you're taught to, to sail and bail, you got to put the main sheet into your tiller extension hand, and get comfortable with uh, multiple things in one hand so you can free up your other hand to make a, to either bail your boat or adjust your sprit or for, you know, laser reach forward and grab your Cunningham and your outhaul. So, um, you know, it's something that I was taught at a young age to get comfortable doing. And uh, that is what you see in this video. But then the other point, so, a big part of this, don't get tangled up. Uh, the reason, I, you know, another reason I throw the vang over there is because now I'm sure it's not wrapped around one of my ankles when I'm about to try and cross the boat. And that's what you'll see as we play through here um, with the main sheet. I just take it right there and I just quickly, you saw me look down and make sure that I'm not about to step on it uh, or have it wrapped around my ankle. And step, I've actually, I've fallen down uh, more times than I care to admit tacking a flying Scott when my foot just lands on the pile of main sheet that's in the cockpit there. It's, it's kind of slippery. Your foot goes out from underneath you. And then you got the whole turtle on your back with the floor of the Flying Scott thing going on, which is not a great, great place to be. So it takes a split second here. Just look down, make sure uh, you're confident where your footing is going to go. And then, uh, and then go through the tack. So I think you're right to kind of point out, Greg, the, you know, the choreography of doing the hand switch on the tiller is, is everything. It makes it a lot easier if you're confident in your ability to do this. So I sort of break it up here. I, I like to get the tiller extension kind of pointed down as I'm doing, um, you know, as the tiller is the furthest over in the turn. Um, and I get the tiller extension kind of pointed down, which helps it get around the main sheet. Because some, if you're not careful, uh, the tiller extension can actually get stuck on the main sheet on the, the vertical part, kind of right in front of my face here. And then you're not able to get the tiller extension across. So 
Um, it's important to get the tiller extension on the other side of the main sheet when the tiller is at its maximum pushed over this. And then um, as you go through the tack, and we may have had, this was a little bit lighter air. I, Jay probably got barked at a little bit here for leaving the, the old rail a little bit too soon. We would have liked a little bit more time on the, the new leeward side to get some roll. But as I begin to go across the boat, what you'll see is my whole body is going to face forward. And I think that that is the key to this whole thing is facing absolutely forward. I'll take what's really kind of a side step. And that actually really helps with your stability as well, getting your, your body sideways uh, to the boat and kind of a wide stance facing forward is going to help you be really nice and stable as you cross. And what you'll see is as the, the tiller comes back, the tiller itself comes back to the middle of the boat and the turn is slowing down. I'm going to take my tiller extension and point it over to the new, the new high side, the new weather side, right where I'm about to sit down. And that again, just kind of widens everything out. So I'm not gonna tangle the main sheet on the tiller extension. Um, and that gives me an idea of where I'm gonna bring my butt and kind of sit right down. And I'll sit all the way down on the rail before I even think about the hand switch. That was a little bit fast, but as you sit down, your hand is kind of waiting for you right there. Um, to, and then you can bring your hands around the front of you. So. That's kind of what I'm looking for. But I think the really big key there is getting that tiller extension pointed across the boat. So when you go and sit down next to it, um, you're able to do the hand switch after you've already sat down. So Coach Fisher, what, uh, what, what are kind of a couple of things that you see here that, you're, you're, that jump out at you other than obviously Zeke's choreography is, is really good from all those years of coaching at the College of Charleston. He, you beat it into them pretty well, but what are a couple of things you might point out? <laughs> well, I, I think um, that was a perfect description, how you move your hands and to be able to see it firsthand is really cool. One thing to mention too, just like you're saying about you throwing the vang over, see, watch your dad chuck the jib sheet over and make sure that that's cleared. And how often do we accidentally step on that as well? There's Jay getting it ready too. So that's cool. And, um, and I just want to point out that you're not jamming the helm down. And, you know, we, we mentioned briefly, and maybe if you could touch on that one more time, Zeke, how you're actually trimming the main in as the boat heads up, but you're not like shoving the helm down to, to beat the boat around the turn and into the tack. You're kind of letting the boat carve up. And that keeps the boat, keeps the flow over the center board and the rudder, and it doesn't stall as easily. And with the main trimmed in, like you're going to do here in a sec, yeah, it helps the boat turn too. up. There you go. There you go. Yeah, so right there, right you there. see the main just came in that little bit. Yeah, I, that's some um, definitely Greg kind of taught me. And I, when we were sailing lightnings together, I would watch you kind of do that and steer the boat really nicely through the tack. It's, you know, if, if there were no rudder on the boat, the main being trimmed in would tell the boat to turn up. The jib being trimmed in tells the boat to turn down. And so when you kind of start turning up through the tack nice and slow, your sails are going to have less wind in them. And it's good to leave the jib nice and eased for that reason. But if you really step on the main sheet, you're bringing the boom into the center. You're keeping the main more full and really closing the leech of the main. And all of that is encouraging the boat to head up. So it's a way to kind of use less rudder. And it's not a lot. You probably saw it in here. It's, you know, uh, so before you step off of these two, Zeke, if I could just throw, throw in two things and you actually stepped off of it, so. Sorry, That's okay. I'm coming back to it. Oh, are you? Okay. Yeah. But I, I, there's two things that I noticed that a lot of folks do, and uh, maybe you could just pause it here, because I just want to say, as you're turning the boat, you'll see the jib start to luff, and you don't really leave the rail. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people, they, they're in a big hurry to get to what the new, new weather side is. And I think that, you know, you show patience in waiting the boat, waiting for the boat to turn. The other thing that is, uh, you know, before you leave the rail and go and, and, and flatten on the other side. The other thing is the angle of heel. And I think a lot of people, they, they've read books that when you're going into a tack or a roll tack, you want to heel the boat to leeward so that the boat rounds up and starts to turn. And I'm just wondering, well, you know, I, I don't see any of that in these eight knot breeze uh, tacks. And, I'm, you know, maybe you guys can emphasize a little bit about your thoughts on how important it is to, to turn the boat by healing it or just kind of letting it, it turn itself? I, you know, I, I don't do that. I'm, I've never been a big fan of, of healing the boat to leeward. 
uh, before the tech to turn up, I kind of feel like it just sort of digs in the, the lured rail a little bit into the water. Um, you definitely don't want to be healing to weather. Uh, that's for sure when you're when you're heading up. But I don't know, Greg. Do you do you encourage people to heal the boat over to leeward? As no, they tack? So for the same reason, Zeke. I think when you heal the boat to leeward to make the boat turn, you kind of lose control of the rate of the turn. And what you're doing so beautifully here is making that rate of the turn smooth, slow, and controlled. And if you heal to leeward, all of a sudden, you're, you, it's going to turn fast. And when it turns fast, it'll stall. You know. Right. Yeah, I think that's the other thing that people should be thinking about as they're going into attack is the idea is, you know, the boat's slowing down all the time during attack. It's lost all the load to sail. And the other thing that's happening is you're, you're losing attached flow across the centerboard. And you, you, the big thing is to get the flow attached back to the centerboard as quick as you can. That's how you go up wind. And that's something I noticed too when you guys come out of the attack, how easy your mainsail is, uh, Zeke, just to build speed, get the boat back up to the speed that you went into the attack into. So that the, you know, again, I'm always thinking about what's going on underneath the surface of the water. Uh, as important as sail trim is and everything else, if you lose attached flow at centerboard, um, you're not going to be able to point. You're not going to be able to go fast upwind. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that? that out. I'm really glad you pointed that out, Brian, about, because we do, we were just talking about pulling the main sheet in to help the boat turn up. Um, but it's super important to get the main sheet eased so that the boat can accelerate, as you're saying. So I'll, I'll do that in a couple different places like right about here where I pause it I'm gonna let my hand is now coming back down towards the main sheet cleat which is easing it out and then about here it's gonna actually run through my hand just to get the main back out and then I'll trim it back in right after the tack but you need to make sure that um, as soon as the, the main is filling on the new side it's in an eased position for acceleration. See, can I um, can I just reaffirm something that you pointed out there is that, you know, in the middle of the tack, the main was rolling a elephant for a couple seconds. And, you know, when you think about it in heavy air, when we go into a tack and the boom is pretty far off center line, if we don't trim the main in as we head up, the main will start luffing real early, you know, and as we head up, if the main stays out and it's luffing early and it has to luff all the way through the eye of the wind and all the way around onto the new tack, we'll really slow down and you know, sometimes even fight to get across the eye of the wind. So using the main by trimming it in to help the boat turn up sounds strange. Maybe even heavier is more important to, to unload the helm and keep the boat up to speed. Is that fair yeah. to say, you think? Well, I think that's an excellent point. Excellent the bank came point. off there, Zeke. So I know um, I fell out of the clean. <laughs> uh, real quick, uh, there's a there's a note here from Stephen Lee about uh, bang tension upwind and in tacking, and we'll, we probably won't go into that very much. We did touch a lot on bang trim in our first webinar, I think, right, Zeke? And that is on uh, the North Seals YouTube channel. We're posting all of our webinars. It takes a couple of days for us to edit out um, all the silly things we say, um, but uh, all these webinars are going to get posted on the YouTube channel. So if you are looking for something specific, maybe about some bang tension stuff, that might be a good place to start. And then if you, uh, if you have more questions, again, reach out to us um, yeah. after thing. But this is kind of, I think we wanted to really focus on these, these tacks. This is a question from Sophie. And uh, we wanted to kind of reach out and kind of go through the choreography of how folks tack. And, you know, Greg, I, as someone who crewed for you, and a bunch of other people over the years, that, that little thing with Jay flicking that, that jib sheet over there. I mean, if anybody who crews on a Flying Scott, if that's the one thing they come out of this tacking thing is, is get the jib sheet out of the way so you don't tangle your feet and your arms and your legs in it, that's a, that's a great tip. Um, I would say that, I would say 90% of the time, every tack that we screw up is because I, get, I got tangled in, a, in, the, in the jib sheet. So um, uh, good job for Jay. He doesn't do everything wrong, Zeke. Like, no, he's perfect. <laughs> he's best. Well, let's, uh, what do you say we move on to the next one? I know we got a, another kind of cool video to go in with this one. We're, um, you know, coming up on our hour here. So the question is about jiving and what kind of just generally go over what techniques can I use to improve my jibes? And yet again, we, we're borrowing one of these, um, these great videos from Eric Bustle that's posted on the class uh, YouTube site. And thanks again to Eric for doing this. And we're kind of going to have to jump around this video a little bit. Um, so while I get that keyed up, 
Greg, you had some thoughts off the bat on just some kind of keys to look for. Well, I think um, a couple of things we're going to see, just like when we talked about the beginning of the tax, is how smooth first Zeke is with the helm. And as we go through the jibe, just watch how very little he moves the tiller off center line. And Jay's the same way, how smooth he is. It's almost like the, the heel of the boat really doesn't change when you watch it relative to the horizon. Um, really impressive. Yeah, and there's some things that I, I do a little bit differently. Maybe we're going through this big motorboat chop here, but um, just for folks that are looking, I know a lot of people, uh, Brian, yourself included, I think you steer the boat with the tiller between your legs, right? I do, yeah. Um, and again, I don't have the, the driving experience you guys do, so uh, I'm still kind of, for lack of a better description, still in the learning phase. Um, I, you know, a couple of years ago got, uh, got a little bit more involved with driving a boat when my son got interested in sailing and we were able to sail together a little bit. And I see you keep the, uh, what is the new guy in your driving hand. For me, I, I, I steer between my legs for the simple reason that if I go to trim the guy or ease the guy, I turn the boat when I'm doing that. And that's certainly something I can work on uh, to do a little better job of. But I just find if I scoop back a little bit and can drive between my legs, um, you know, I do it, you know, you know, it all, a lot of different boats I sail sometimes, but um, definitely the Scott, because I, I just find when I'm flying both through the jibe, I, it, for me, it's a little bit more stable. Um, I think, you know, it's just stuff you've learned to, to go do. So I, I, I watch you do this in this video uh, a bunch of times today. And uh, I, don't, I don't think I could do it as well as you could do it without a whole bunch of practice. So, and it's interesting you mentioned this, this chop and um, how high you have to sail to keep the spinnaker fly. That's actually a really, really tough jibe in my opinion. You, you jive right in the chop and down speed and you know, Jay and you guys just being able to keep that, that spinnaker flying was pretty impressive, so. Yeah, just for me, it's more comfortable and yeah having it in my tiller hand and not having to kind of move my weight around too much with the tiller between my legs to steer the boat. That's kind of why I do it that way, but it's just whatever you're comfortable with and, and practice for sure makes perfect. But I know one thing we wanted to talk about, and, and by the way, in this video, we, we do a lot of actually talking through the videos. And so if you ever want to come back to this on the Flying Sky YouTube page, it's there and it's, um, it's narrated with questions from Eric and me and my dad. So um, that'll walk you through kind of the step-by-step -step stuff. But one thing we wanted to kind of talk about is uh, when you're supposed to, when to put the new guy uh, into the guy hook. Greg, what, you had some thoughts on that. Well, I think um, <clears throat> when you come out of the job, right? Right, right. I think um, if you get it, if you try to put, don't put it in, let's say that, um, before you put the pole on. I think sometimes it's hard to grab the guy. So like this is light to medium air and Jay's making it work because it's not real breezy. But you can imagine right there how he had to reach for it. If um, there was more breeze, it could be a little trickier. One thing we're going to see is when Jay, oh man, Jay lost his hat. <laughs> <laughs> One thing we're going to see when Jay lets the, the guy off right here he does, he doesn't just blow it out of the guy hook and let it go. Can you back up and do that one? Um, <clears throat> like right here, he's going to reach up and it's in the top right shot there. He's going to let his hand gradually go up with the guy and not just blow it out so that Zeke can take the slack up nice on the new, old guy new sheet. You know, otherwise, if he just knocked it out of the hook and let it go, the pole would slam forward, the spinnaker would fall behind the main. So that's really valuable. And it's interesting, on this jibe, Jay put it in the guy before. So you can see it both ways, which is kind of cool. Yeah, we sort of, it, on our boat, it just depends on how much wind there is. If it's, if it's really light air, then I don't like the, guy, the new guy going into the hook right away because I feel like it can just kind of choke the spinnaker in. It's extra friction now if I want to be easing the guy as the, as the breeze is filling. So if it's light, and I'm saying it's probably under eight knots or something like that, then we'll, then we'll leave the guy for after the pole is made. Anything over that, 
I think, like you said, Greg, it's quite important to get the guy up right under the hook as soon as you come out of the jive to kind of bring the kite in and control the spinnaker a little bit. Yeah. And, and you would always knock it out of the guy before you go into the jibe, right? Yeah. Yep. So the first thing that we do is Jay's going to, he passes the sheets back to me. I, I always trim the guy on our boat, so I already have that, but he'll pass me the sheet. And that's the first thing he does is, is go and, and let that out of the hook so it's free to kind of fly around. Yeah. So real quick, uh, guys, real quick, uh, a, a note uh, from um, – from Mark on the, on the chat was that uh, maybe a little bit of confusion just about who's flying the spinnaker, the, the, the crew or the skipper. And uh, for us, I mean, obviously on our teams, I think the crew is always flying the spinnaker, except for the jibes. Um, this, the, my crew always has a spinnaker sheet and actually Brian, when he was sailing with me, got to the point where he was able to control the guy and manage that well, which opened it up so I could drive and look around and see what I needed to do. Is that what you guys were doing? I mean, you mentioned you might use uh, have the guy in your hand a lot of the times, he, but but Jay's trimming the spinnaker except through the maneuver, right? Correct. Yeah, he's trimming the sheet all the way around the course, and I, I do the guy on our boat. I know there there are some teams out there where the skipper does uh, both the guy and the sheet, and then the the crew is looking back doing the kind of tactical decisions. But um, on our boat, I do the guy, and my dad does the sheet. And I'm just going to run through the job. Yeah, so two two more quick questions. This one's easy for Brian McCarthy. Is that well, you use the upper mast ring or the lower mast ring for the inboard pole? And actually, while you while you asked the question, I looked out at my boat, and I I think they're about four inches apart. And uh, the only thing I can remember telling Brian when he, when it got breezy in Sandusky, he's like, "What rig?" And I'm like, "Whichever one you can get it on." And so <laughs> I I don't think it really you know I don't think it, that difference makes that big of a difference. Uh, you could say the, the lower ring in lighter air, but you, I mean, you guys think it's that big of a difference with which ring it gets on? No, I, I, I agree. I always thought the reason they were there so close together. So when we broke one, we always had another one there. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, I feel like there probably is a right answer, but I, I don't know what it is. If you guys don't, then you know, it's probably not the biggest, the biggest thing in the world. Uh, yeah. Maybe just what you're, how tall, how tall is the crew putting it on? It might be easier right. for, yeah. for different sized I, people. It, it is a good question because a lot of people, you know, they read a book and say, up, you know, inboard end, up, um, upward end. But I don't think you're going to get that much more extension. You know, the idea is to put the pole at 90 degrees. We'll talk a little bit about pole placement here in a second. But um, it, it's whatever one your team can get it on. That's the last thing I would worry about is which ring it was on. I, you know, I'd be more about let's get it clicked in. Let's get the guy back down. Let's get it hooked up and let's get the sheet back in your hand so we can keep sailing. So um, the only other thing I wanted to mention, and then we can kind of move on to the, the trim stuff uh, unless you guys have other points, but there's a, you saw him there when Jay would pull the boom over and kind of help the, help the, uh, the boom come over by grabbing the vang. You can see it in a decent shot here. Um, he's, he's being patient with it and he's not wrestling with pulling the boom over. It's very nice to kind of help the boom get over but you don't want to just reach over and grab it and use all your strength to pull it over because now you're trimming the main incorrectly, but you kind of just saw him there. He reaches up and grabs it and just kind of guides it across and he pulls a little bit of tension down on the vang, which helps the, the leech actually pop through and get the main over. So that can be really helpful when the main sheet's way out and you know the skipper isn't going to be able to trim it in a bunch. So can I, can I get you guys to answer another quick question that we got on the chat? And uh, it actually, it's a, it is a great video for you to kind of go through it and what your preference is, but it's um, from Pete and Ann Seidman up in Saratoga. Um, it's, do you always keep the pole attached after the jive, which I think that they're referring to, you know, when you're jiving, you keep the pole on one side, you jive the pole. And, um, you know, what, when, when does the pole come over and does it depend on wind conditions? What are your guys' thoughts on that, the choreography of that? Greggy. Anybody? Anybody? I, I would I would do it just like you're doing it here, Zeke. I think this is excellent where Jay leaves it on the mast, leaves it on the guy until you actually get the boom across and you're on the new jive. For us, the only exception would be when, I guess I want to call it survival conditions, where that can sometimes be tough if you get it through a jive and the boat's kind of unstable and it's hard to get around to get the pull off the ring on the mast. So we might knock it off the mast and let it just hang 
on the old guy and of course on the topping lift. But, um, but that only be if we were in really survival conditions. You know, for us, it was like 12. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never, we've never attempted uh, any other way than this, where as long as the, the guy comes out of the hook, we just go right and get the main over and then worry about the pole completely once the main is over. I just, I would worry that, you know, if the, if the, the skipper gets impatient and swings the boom over before the crew's done getting the pole off the guy, that's a really bad place for the crew to be is kind of up there behind the vang and the boom uh, up against the shroud. So I know I've seen, I've seen Amy Linton do a pretty cool one in the really light air where she'll actually go up on the bow and she sort of uses her toe and, and gets the guy out of the hook with her toe and then does the pull through the jive. And that's pretty darn cool, but we have not learned that one yet. So we, we do it this way every time, no matter what. See, can I hit one more thing? Be yeah. one more horse here. I, I just keep watching this and how smooth, slow, and controlled you are going into the jibe. Just like we saw how smooth, slow, and controlled you are going into the tax. And I just think that that is so important to, to remember because, you know, often when we come out of a maneuver, whether it's a tack or a jibe, and we're not in that sweet spot where you want to be. Sometimes if we're jibing, we come out too hot and it's hard to keep the boat from heeling over to leeward, or sometimes we don't come through the jibe enough and we're by the lee real hard and worried about flipping over to weather, it's because we, we maybe went through the jibe too fast, you know, and whereas when you're controlled like this, and like you said, Jay's right here, not throwing the boom over, he's just encouraging it over, you know, that allows the boat to jibe kind of at its own time when it's right and come out at the right angle. I just think that is such a, you can see it so clearly here. And, the, and as a result, the boat just is perfectly balanced all the time. Yeah, the way I look at it is, and I think it's actually the first thing I mentioned in this video on, on YouTube is that there's just not much to be gained from rushing these jives. You know, so, sometimes tactical situations happen where you need to jive pretty quick, but doing them correctly step-by-step slow and um you know just slow and smooth is so much better than trying to rush there's just nothing to gain from trying to race and get this done and it's not a it's not a time trial here so just be thoughtful and methodical follow your steps and um you know do things accurately including hitting that exit angle with the turn so um all this stuff's really good. Two, two quick notes, uh, which are not exactly about driving. One is uh, I noticed your outhaul is on and people ask that question and we, we, we touched on it in the first thing. We'll just circle back because it's a great picture of the fact that uh, you're not loosening your outhaul going downwind. So um, that's one thing I want to point out to, to somebody. And if you have questions more about that kind of setup, uh, feel free again to go back to the YouTube channel and, and kind of review our first webinar. Um, the second thing, and we're gonna, I think we should probably these uh, videos are on the Flying Scott channel and they're, they're really instructional, really good. Uh, you and Jay practice this stuff and that's how come you guys have gotten so good at it and I would encourage people to get out and maybe watch the video a little bit and once we can get our boats on the water again is to kind of go and, and practice and, and just, you know, that, that's the way you get good at this stuff. So uh, if you guys are comfortable with it, I, uh, we still have one more, one or two more questions we want to get through. We're getting past our hour here, so I wanna, don't want to rush people out of here, but it is a holiday weekend and we just want to do it. Um, before we dive into this, you can leave this, this template up, this, this, uh, this question up. But uh, Sophie Skipper uh, had mentioned, we, we, uh, her, her actual question earlier was about roll tack. And I, I just want to circle real back for Tomas. And he was asking, uh, the tacking video you showed, you didn't roll tack. Do you ever roll tack in light air? And how do you do that? And I think we kind of addressed it, guys. And maybe you could just, you know, you know maybe touch on it just real quick for two minutes is that I think we all kind of decided that roll tacking a flying scout when it's, when it's the right time to do it, it's really hard physically to have enough weight to actually make a big difference. And I'm just wondering, uh, just if you guys are kind of in agreement with that, that we kind of, you know, it's hard to roll tack it like you would see in a laser or a 420 and stuff, but you do need to use your weight to help coerce it in light air. Maybe Greg, you could touch on that a little bit real quick before we go to the next one. I think you hit, hit it right on the head, Brian, you know, and it's funny, I, I want to say in the old days when we sailed with three people and we had almost 500 pounds in the boat, 
you really truly could roll tack the boat in light air. Everybody would hit the weather rail as you're kind of crossing the eye of the wind. You'd push the old weather side down and, and you'd really be able to promote a true roll tack. And I think Zeke said it perfectly when we were watching the video, it's, it's not so much that you're, you're trying to really push that rail down, because like you say, Brian, we don't have the weight as much. It's more like you're allowing the boat to roll over on top of yourself, you know, as you're staying on the leeward side. And, you know, Zeke said maybe if Jay had stayed down there a little longer, maybe the boat would have healed a little more to leeward, so it could have been a little more of a squish healed more to lured as it was crossing the eye of the wind and filling on the new tack and then squish it flat. Um, but, but is that fair to say? I mean, I think it's hard to really muscle the boat around and, and it's not worth messing up good form and good steering and good sail trim to try to make that happen. Is that- yeah, I, I, I was gonna say that I think that Zeke mentioned during our practice session, I don't wanna again spend too much time going backwards on this, but you're talking about if Jay's in the middle of the boat, then you know it's light enough that you need to kind of stay to that new leeward side longer during the tack and try to force that rail over and, and let, this, let the sail plan fall on you a little bit more. That's kind of your, your indicator. Exactly. That, Exactly. If, if, if it's not windy enough that just sailing up wind, Jay is, uh, if it's not windy enough that he can be on the rail, so he's sitting on the seat or on the trunk or even all the way to leeward, those are the conditions that we will do the roll tack in. And as Greg said, all we'll do is as we turn up through the wind, Jay would move so that he could get up to the rail on what's going to become the new leeward side. And he'll switch the jib from there. Um, after we go through the wind and I'll kind of stay down on that side as well. It's now the leeward side. And just as the sails fill, it's gonna, the boat's just going to sort of lean over on top of you a little bit. And depending again on how much wind there is, there will be some varying amount of us flattening the boat. If it's really light, it might, I might sit on the leeward side for five seconds after the tack and then, and then go across the boat or a little windier than that. And I'll just go right and cross up to the other side of the boat, leaving Jay on the leeward side. As it gets a little windier, he'll start helping me flatten by coming to the middle of the boat. And finally, he'll come all the way to the high side. And then by the time he's up there, we're not roll tacking anymore. So it's really all under, you know, probably eight knots, eight or nine knots. And we're both starting to get up to the rail. Um, and then we're, we're not thinking about roll tacking anymore. So that's kind of the idea. And again, it's just helping the boat get a little bit, you get a little bit of a, a rock out of the boat coming back to flat after the tack. And that's kind of why, why we do it in a really light air. Right. I think if I could just make one point that I see with teaching clinics and watching people sail in the really, really light air, I think helms people generally are, and sometimes crew are, are too quick to hop to the other side. And that's one thing I think that people might want to practice in light, light air, uh, get the idea of let the boat fall on top of you. Um, listen, it's pretty, I mean, I'm going to say this and might be out of turn, but it's pretty hard to flip a flying scot over, uh, especially in three knots of breeze. And, uh, you know, we've seen all seen the commercials, the pictures where people are hanging off the shrouds and we've got, you know, 65 people on a flying scot. It's designed to be very stable. And I think that people have a tendency in really, really light air to not let the boat roll on top of each other. And I think that's a little bit or on top of themselves. That's what you were describing, Zeke, is that stay to leeward for I guess a couple seconds let the, the sail plan load up and fill before you might step across smoothly and and squish it or flatten it and so uh, I would say that anybody who wants to get a little bit better at roll tacking per se um, may just want to work in a light air day of getting used to the idea of pushing the helm over and letting the ball fall a boat fall on top of you and sit to leeward for a second do the whole you know Cordelia Shields thing sitting to leeward looking at the jib and and then step across so I think people have a tendency to, to hurry across too quick and then the boat sits in itself and never gets going again. So I hope that kind of helped Sophie a little bit understand uh, where our thoughts are on roll tacking of Flying Scott uh, back in the day. And by the way, Greg, some of us still sail at 500 pounds, even with two of us. So, um, so, so we, we might have a little advantage, uh, may not be such a big advantage in light air, but anyway. Um, uh, we hope that helped. Uh, but anyway, let's let's get back to the last question or two. And this is uh, 
question about spinnaker trim, and there's been a couple of, uh, that have come through, and hopefully we can we can touch on these pretty quickly. We just want to hit a couple of key points that we think are important for folks who are trying to focus on a few three or four things to to get better at uh, flying the spinnaker. And uh, I think our, our initial impression when we look at this is that these guys have great form. It looks great. Uh, the sail's full. Um, there's a couple of things that are going on really well here. I think Zeke and Greg and I all agreed that we were really excited to see how the jib was luffing or bubbling. And we want to make sure that that kind of happens uh, when we're going downwind so that we can um, not block the wind to the, to the spinnaker. Anytime the jib is kind of full or pressurized, it's going to make it the leech end of the, the spinnaker kind of unstable. But Greg, you and I were talking about a um, couple things that we thought might even be a little bit better. And the first thing that jumped out at me, and, and maybe you can touch on that. Yeah, I, well, you pointed out, Brian, I think it's a great guide is right where you're circled is the skirt of the spinnaker, you know, like between the two clues. It, when that gets too close to the jib, the flow out the bottom of the spinnaker is is cut off, you know, I mean, to be kind of technical. But what we're looking at here is that skirt is pretty darn close to the jib. And um, in an ideal world, that would probably be a couple feet off the for staying off the jib and there, just like we see here with Jeff and Amy. And in that other picture, it might have just been moving the pole forward a little bit, easing the sheet a little bit and letting the spinnaker get a little fatter, if you will, in the bottom and let the, um, let the bottom breathe a little more. But this is a great shot showing the skirt. And clearly there's more wind here, so that doesn't hurt. But that, you know, keeping that as a guide in mind is that we want to keep that, that skirt clear and because um, the breeze does flow out the bottom of the spinnaker too. Right. And what I really liked about both of these pictures is that you saw how eased out the jib is. Um, it's really important like you know the, it's nice to have the jib full and drawing wind down wind. You don't want it to be luffing but you would rather have it luffing than be over trimmed right because that's gonna uh, really impact and create a lot of turbulent air that's going into the spinnaker. So you'd much rather err on having the jib too loose. And in both of these shots, you see the jib is really nice and eased, uh, helping the spinnaker stay full. Yeah. You know, one thing, Zeke, there was a question I think we had back early on from Frank Gary, where he asked, I think, if we drop the jib ever in light air. And I don't know if you guys mess with that with only two people, but back in the day with a real tight rig and light air, we would actually drop the jib when it was light to kind of keep that flow between the main and the spinnaker. And I'm not suggesting that, but that just kind of enforces your point, yours and Brian's point that that jib needs to be eased so it doesn't shut that slot down. Yeah, we'll do it. Um, we'll, we'll take the jib down if it's really, really light air. We're talking, you know, under probably six knots or five knots. In fact, I think Jeff Linton, who you see in this picture sailing, they, they went out and tested this in Davis Island a few years back. So if you ask him over a beer after a day of sailing, he'll tell you 6.4 6 knots or whatever it is that, uh, that you start actually gaining by having the jib down. But it's really, really, really light. You're sailing pretty bow up anyway. And uh, in those conditions, we, we will do it. We have done it before, especially if, it's, say, it's a downwind finish and we're on the final run. So we don't have to worry about remembering to put it back up because that would be pretty tragic to forget to get the jib back up. <laughs> Um, but generally speaking, and I, and I think actually Jeff and those guys proved it in Tampa that once it's six knots or so, the jib's um, certainly not hurting you and it's probably starting to help you a little bit downwind if it's trimmed correctly, nice and loose like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah I remember the, uh, you know, Greg, you sail with the, the loose rig and, and downwind and light air and it, it could be pretty brutal because the rig was bounced around stuff and we would actually sometimes have to keep the jib up and crank it on and kind of pull the rig forward so it wouldn't bounce around and real real lump stuff but uh exactly. yeah we, we take we take the jib down uh if it gets real real drifty and stupid because then again what ends up happening is your angles change right if it's three knots of breeze two knots of breeze you can't sail dead downwind you gotta head up a little bit and keep some pressure in the spinnaker and uh the, the jib hop it just makes it more difficult for the wind to get to that bigger sail uh before you before you switch on slide zeke and real quick uh, again um, notice the vang tension on Jeff's main and the vang is off a lot and we, we talk about how much vang tension to have going downwind and, and that's pretty eased and if you could just maybe circle that that little telltale above the baton number two if you don't mind 
you know, some people talk about, um, you know, how can you tell if your bag is set right? And working with the Paralympic teams with their two sail programs, we would work very hard on getting the lured telltales to go vertical. And you can see here this um, the leech telltale on, on Jeff's main is going vertical, which means that the wind is actually exiting it. And the, the, the wind is hitting it flat from behind. And as it hits, it's vertically leaving the sail. And that's those telltales, if you can get the vang kind of set up so that those telltales, that telltale there or the one above it on the, on the top baton will fly vertically, that, that's kind of a good indication. I, I, I don't want to say you need to focus on that because that could be something that, you know, they bounce around a little bit. But that picture does kind of show that the wind leaves the sail vertically uh, going downwind off the main. And that's something we've really worked hard with the Paralympic teams with their two sail programs. And it, and it works with any boat going dead downwind. So if Jeff had the vang on a whole lot harder, that telltale would stall, close the leech down, and the wind wouldn't be able to escape vertically off the sail. So that's that's a little tip. If you're, if you're looking to for something a little bit new or something to look at, that's, that's another way to use those leech telltales. So. Yeah, that's a great, that's a really neat tip. I had never heard that one before, Brian. Greg, can you just like moving on to this picture, we're just trying to set up, you know, how, how to set the pole height maybe and, and how to know where, how far back to pull the pole or forward. What do you see in this picture that you like? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think we need to have a cool guide um, for knowing the pole height because we've always said in the books and all that jazz, the two ends should be even. And that sounds good, but we're not exactly in a spot to see the lured clue here, right? I mean, it's behind the main and um, there's no way to really see it. But the center seam of the spinnaker, which goes from the top through the numbers down to the middle of the foot, hopefully is perpendicular to the clues if it was put together well, you know, if we did that right. And in an ideal world, that center seam would be parallel to the mast. So in this shot, you know, it's not too far off, but one might argue if we lowered the pole a little bit, those two lines would be more parallel and then the chute would fly ideal. It would fly better, you know? So, and this is what we would see most often in light air. You know, when, the, when we sail into a light spot and the spinnaker starts to sag and the lured clue will drop down, the center seam will poke out to weather like we see here. And if that center seam went the other way in a puff, you know, where it angled behind the main, you know, um, like this here, then we'd know we'd need to raise the pole. And it's not like it has to be absolutely perfect, but it just gives you a real good guide. And, and the trimmer is in the perfect place to really eyeball it. Is that, a, do you guys agree with that? I love that. Yeah, the center seam parallel yeah. with the mast is a really good visual that we can all have. What about how far back to pull the pole? What kind of tricks do you have for that and setting that square? Well, Brian flew the chute a whole lot, and we both had the same guide with the telltale on the topping lift that we really liked. What Talk about that, Brian. Yeah, so uh, we have a telltale that we put about a foot or two up on the topping lift. Um, and it's just, you know, it's either some cassette tape, something, you know, when I sailed with Greg, it had to be something from the 60s or 70s. Um, so, <laughs> well, but, um, <laughs> um but it's just a little piece of tell, uh, telltale that will that helps us that when the wind flows across the, the topping lift itself, I'm trying to make that telltale 90 degrees to the pole. And it's it's moving around a fair bit for sure, um, but it's it's a, an easy indicator. And I know Zeke, you, you have that telltale there on the shroud, which isn't your boat, but it, we all have telltales in the shroud, which is a big deal. And that's another thing you can use. I prefer it on the topping lift itself because when I'm looking and staring up at the spinnaker, the topping lift is right in my line of vision anyway. And so I can look real quick and see if I'm pretty close with the pole. If I have to look back at the shroud and then look at the pole and stuff, um, I just want everything right in my line of vision. Uh, I know some people attach it right at the pole or on the pole. The problem with that is when the wind hit the, hits the pole, it deflects, it goes around this the surface. And so it gets disturbed. And so if I'm just tying it to that topping lift, that line, there's a little, there's a better chance of having it a little less disturbed wind. Um, it still gets a little bit disturbed, but, but not as bad for sure. And that's just an easy way. So again, that telltale 90 degrees to the pole, you know, 80 degrees, 90 degrees, it, it, you just try to keep it square up to the pole. So that's, that's one little tip you can use, I think. 
Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And when we talk about trimming the spinnaker downwind, we're always talking about kind of this, this curl uh, to have in the leech. Um, and, you know, talk about how much, how much curl is too much, how quickly you got to trim it out and um, just your method of actually trimming the kite. And Brian, maybe that's back to you as a, as a champion crewing for Greg trimming kite. Yeah, it was a long time ago. So I, with a lot of therapy, I've recovered, but um, so <laughs> I, uh, you know, this is actually a, a nice little curl and people talk about the fact, well, you know, if you're not having full projected area, uh, you're not getting the maximum out of the spinnaker, but this is something we're always looking for, for a foot, a foot and a half of curl in the leech of the sail. And it's a constant movement of, of the sheet and or the guy to make sure that that curl is always in there. Uh, you know, we start to add all these things up, right, guys? We start to add up the fact that, you know, is the pole square? Is the foot getting too close to the head stay? If it is, do I need to let both the guy and the sheet forward so that they, the spinnaker begins to fly out like, like a kite? You know, we call a spinnaker a kite, and that's really what it is. We're trying to fly it like a kite. Um, so the spinnaker trimmer actually has become totally unaware of where the boat is and more think just concentrating on how to fly a kite. And if the boat turns 30 degrees, it shouldn't matter because all you're doing is using both strings to fly the kite. But that um, if foot, foot and a half a curl, the reason that's important is it gives you, make sure that there's flow coming off the leech of the spinnaker. And what will end up happening if you have that curl pulled out, uh, it's very quick to have the leech side, the, the leeward side of the spinnaker stall out and it's slow. Uh, there's a big mainsail bl blocking the wind hitting the spinnaker and that leeward side really needs as much flow across as possible to be as most its most efficient shape. So we're always trying to target to have that curl a little bit. I, I personally love the way this one's curling from the you know couple feet below the head right down uh, through this through the center panel and I don't like it to curl at the very bottom. So this kind of the whole shoulder flow in, that's probably about the maximum I'd like to see. And then I give it a little three or four inch tweak on the sheet, have that curl come out a little bit and then just keep easing. But uh, I think know, that was perfect, our... Brian. I think the, the way I think about it, the reason the curl is good, it's more about avoiding over trimming the spinnaker. And like you were saying before, if you without this curl, you're in danger of having the, the spinnaker over trimmed and that's the slowest that you can have. If you're under trimmed a little bit like this, you're not losing much, you're still really powered up. You're not losing a significant amount of, of sail area. It's, um, it's just a good sign that you're not over trimmed. Yeah. And what you said right there at the end, you give three or four inches of trim or something like that. And I think that's, that's so important. Even if the curl gets a little bit bigger than this one foot or one and a half feet, you can't just pull the sheet in really, really hard because you're going to end up over trimming. The second that the curl goes away, you're now in danger of it being over trimmed. So I almost think in, in terms of you want to be trimming the sheet so that you're sort of teasing the spinnaker to do this curl and to live kind of right on the edge of that curl. But you don't want to just do a big pump and see the curl go away because now every second you're sailing with the curl totally gone, it may be over trimmed. So it's just so important to be delicate with that trim and leave it just nervous and just kind of teasing that part of the, the spinnaker to curl. Yeah, so you can, I think the thing too with the three and four, sorry, Greg, is that, you know, if I'm trimming it more than three or four inches, five or six inches, uh, and I'm still getting a curl, I'm going to make an adjustment on the pole. And I right. think uh, Shelly just asked about, you know, uh, it moving the pole around a lot. And it's, again, it, I can't emphasize enough, you, you, you're moving both at the same time because you're just trying to keep that spinnaker flying out there by itself and the boat's rotating around it. So uh, you need to use them both. So, you know, to her point, the point of Shelly, like always moving the, the, the pole, it has to, because the wind never just stays steady. I mean, Greg, do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And actually, <laughs> that's what I was gonna emphasize, what you had said earlier, Brian, about that, you know, three to four inch adjustment. It, it's not like you're going through a foot and a half on the sheet. And when you, when you guys agree, and I think you said it, Zeke, it's not like you're going to jerk it in. You're going to gradually ease it in and out. And it's a very smooth, um, you know, trim. And, and if it's a big change, like there's a big shift, then you would need to move the guy as well. Just like you said, Brian, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think it's both, right? I mean, yeah. you know, Zeke, you say you, you play the guy. And if you see a thing curl two feet and Jay's still pulling the sheet, you're, either turning the boat down or you're letting the guy forward. It's all, 
it's all one giant choreographed boat of happiness. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you might, you might even sometimes to, on a lot of boats that I'll sail and trim the spinnaker, I'll, if I see the curl, I'll just let the guy go for it instead of trimming a lot of times. It's important for sure that they're both, um, they're both well, very dynamic. And Shelly's question, should it be, should it be cleated? I, I don't ever want to see the word cleat around the guy, really, if you don't have to, it should never be cleated. It should always be moving a little bit. I think what ends up happening, and we're going to get to this last slide, but you know, we, we from the very first slide to talking about the spinnaker, we saw that spinnaker that got sucked up into the boat, right, up into the forest day, versus the one that was flying away. And if you just keep trimming the sheet, trimming the sheet, you just keep pulling it closer and closer to the boat. So at some point, you may have to let the guy forward, or the spinnaker, or the skipper has to head down, and that's the communication. So anyway, uh, that's kind of the look we're looking for. I think if that's a nice kind of curl. Uh, and this hey, is uh, a slide hey, we Brian, talked about. Brian, yep. I'm, I'm sorry. Could, could we go back to just real quick for Zeke to touch on back one more, maybe? And you mentioned it in the last slide, setting the main halyard tension downwind. Would you touch on that? Just because this is the perfect picture to describe it. Yeah, we we mentioned in the last the last webinar about setting the the main halyard upwind to get the overbend wrinkles correct. And the point was that you really want to set it for the downwind. And you can see it in this photo, uh, this photo here, there's no, let me just get a line up there. There's no uh, tension wrinkle in here, certainly from the main halyard being too tight, it's kind of nice and smooth. And even if we move on, I think to this, this one here, I really like, because this is where that wrinkle is gonna show up first, is up, up here. If your main halyard is over uh, tension, you're gonna see a stretch wrinkle, you know, from the head down, down in here, where you start seeing a fold in the main kind of right up next to the mast. So this is actually a really good shot as well, where you're seeing the main halyard is not over trimmed and, and it's going to set up well for the upwind um, as well. If you, if you need a little Cunningham upwind to make it so, then that's, that's what you have to do, but you really need to have it set for this downwind the way you see it here, nice and smooth coming off the mast. That'll be different in lighter, medium, and heavy winds, right? I mean, that, that wrinkle is going to appear as the loads change. And so, you, you know, as we mentioned earlier in the, the, the first webinar, that, that you do it before, based on the conditions, not just pull it up to a mark. Right. So uh, real quick, we're going to talk about Spinnaker Halyard, and, and I'm really, really hopeful the two of you can get through this without laughing. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, we talked a, a little bit um, you know, what's in our tuning guide and Greg and I are kind of one camp because we've always done it that way. And honestly, I haven't known any better. And Zeke maybe has a, a different thought, which I thought was pretty interesting that we have two really successful sailors in two different ways about talk about spinnaker halyard. So Greg, maybe touch on what we did for years and maybe Zeke, you can talk about why you do things the way you do and then uh, let folks make their own decisions. Yeah. I mean, there are different styles and it's kind of what you're, what you're used to and what fits you the best. But we always would tie um, a long bowline at the head of the spinnaker to, to let it fly off the top of the mast six to eight inches or so. And, and it isn't something we'd ever change for lighter, heavier, medium air. It always was like that. And frankly, we would do that in every boat, not, not just the Scott. And our, my idea was two things. One, it would allow the slot between the spinnaker and the main to be just that much wider when there was wind to kind of push it away from the mast and, um, you know, allow the flow to get around the backside of the spinnaker a little bit easier. Um, when you were going downwind and your heel to weather a little bit, the spinnaker would rotate out to weather and away from the back of the main. And then the other thing that I thought was kind of nice is that it would allow the top of the spinnaker to move out from the mast and make that a little more vertical and a little more projected area. But let's face it, we're talking just a few inches here and um, you know, the difference yep. isn't huge, but, but that's, those are the reasons we- um, Could have did that. Now we found out we're doing it all wrong, right? Cause I was Zeke and Jeff or Zeke, you, you guys, you tied up pretty tight up against the mast there, right? Yeah, well, we have, um, we've got the little stopper ball, the little plastic ball in the halyard that's just there to make sure that the halyard doesn't jump the shiv and get stuck up there. So we have that little ball and then we tie the bowl and up as tight as we can to that ball. So it's probably two to three inches or so by the time all that's um, taken into account. And 
by the way, for any differences between me and Greg on opinion, I would invite you to look back to the scoreboard on the first slide. He has won seven North American oh, championships. Oh, that's a good, 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 would, good point, you know, yeah. Let's, I'm, I'm going to have to rethink this whole thing. But, oh. um, you know, I, I just find that when it hangs off the mast too much, it becomes a bit unstable and kind of allows the sail to wiggle around a little bit. And I just think specifically in the lighter air, there's – you're not getting much benefit from it. If, if you're sailing up on kind of a reaching angle, then the spinnaker in my mind sort of rotates to leeward now a little bit if it's hanging off like that. And that just seems like it might get even more behind the main. So I think definitely in lighter air, I'm just a bigger fan of having it up all the way. And that's going to kind of also help with keeping the tension on the luff. You know, one of the reasons we lower the pole in light air is to increase the tension on the luff to help support the spinnaker. And so to me, it just makes sense to have it all the way up in the lighter air. And then in the heavy air, I can see, um, you know, when you're squared back and sailing deep downwind, wanting to get it out to weather a little bit. Uh, and I could always just ease the halyer down a couple of inches, but frankly, I never really do. I just put it all the way up and go. And um, I just think the stability issue is, is important to have it up against the, the mast and in one spot just makes the sail a little bit easier to trim, but. So no one's ever uh, accused me of being the fastest guy in the world downwind, so, you know. Not yet. Not yet. So, anyway, that was uh, Mark had asked that question. And, you know, I think the important thing here about this is there's, there's two ways to kind of go about it. I, I do agree with you, Zeke. I think it does add stability when you tie it up tight. And, you know, I'm also with Greg that, you know, especially if you can get to the point where you're going dead downwind, you get spinnaker rotated around. Uh, I think that, that helps getting it away from the main. But, you know, also, Zeke, we could put another mark on the halyard and just drop it two or three inches if you want to get right. that fancy. But uh, what it comes down to is that do what you're most comfortable with. It's not that big of a deal breaker between the two of you, 11 North American championships. So anyway, that, hopefully and that hand answers your question. Yeah, and one thing that Greg, Greg and I did agree on here, we were talking about, you know, how, how really should we, should we sail the boat down the wind? We agreed, um, do it like this. This is the fastest way to go, I think. <laughs> so just until you're going like that, just keep keep working at it. Keep working. This, at is, it, yeah. this is pretty pretty impressive shot. I, what's um? You got a story with that kite or something, right, Greg? Well, just <laughs> it, this is Joni Palmer, and um, I think this might have been a Christmas card or something where it was called <laughs> barely planing. <laughs> they look like they're fully planing to me. Yeah. Drum roll. Drum roll for sure, for sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, uh, listen, uh, we have gone well over our allotted time, and we apologize to everybody for, for drolling on so long. I knew that when I got uh, two of my favorite sailors together, we were going to talk too long. But um, anyway, uh, I want to thank both of you guys. Zeke, uh, I, I know you've been so busy doing a bunch of these webinars and you've been knocking each and every one of them out of the park. And uh, I know you deserve a little bit of a break for putting these on. And so hopefully you can take a week or two off and, and kind of regroup. You did an amazing job uh, this. And Greg, uh, again, uh, you're just awesome. It's, you know, I'm, I'm proud to, you know, be called your friend. Yeah, I'm still your friend, right? <laughs> this week, anyway. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, such a professional and so much experience and just uh, your approach to everything with sailing. We, we both, Zeke and I, are very grateful that you were able to spend a little time with us today. Well, thanks, Brian. I'm honored you guys included me. It's been fun. So, Zeke, yeah. uh, real quick, any last minute things you want to sign off with before we <laughs> let everybody go? No, I just, no, just want to say thanks, obviously, to Greg for being here. Brian has done all of the work on these webinars. He said I did stuff, but he's really been working his tail off on this. So big thanks to Brian. And thanks, everybody that's, that's here, either watching live or going to watch this thing later. It's just so cool to be involved in a class with so many Flying Scott enthusiasts. And want to say thanks to the class for all that they do. And another shout out to Eric uh, with those cool videos. They really help make these things fun for us to go back and relive. So thank you guys. Yeah. You know, all right, guys. Go ahead, Greg. Cool. Can I just say, Brian, one thing that's cool about the Scott class is that, you know, all the sailors that are really experienced and been doing a long time are willing to share what they know. And you two guys especially are open for questions or calls or whatever, right? To to help any way you can. That's always been your MO. Yeah, well, we learn for the best. So again, uh, appreciate everybody. Uh, do me a favor, everybody uh, enjoy the holiday weekend. Stay safe uh, with any luck whatsoever. Uh, we'll be back on the water. I've got my 
my Cedar Point Yacht Club vest on. So hopefully we'll see you guys at Cedar Point in a couple months if everything gets a whole lot better. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. And again, thanks to the class, Greg and Zeke. Uh, stay safe and uh, let us know if you have questions. Reach out to us, okay? Guys, Thank we'll you. talk to you soon, for sure. Thank you. Thanks. For sure. For sure. <laughs> for sure.